日はあの、えー、英語話せる人をしてあげてください。Uh, who, who speaks English? Nihongo, <laughs>、uh, uh, Shadar Shito.、Uh, who speaks Japanese? Alright. Ego, Shika, Shadar Shito. Only English. One, two, three. Nihongo, Shika, Shadar Shito. Okay. あのほとんどの流れが今日あの英語で流れると思うんで、えーえーまあ、その辺ちょっとすみません<笑><笑>一応はいそれだけですあとはヤンさんが先ほども言ったけど左の人右の人を知らなかったらぜひ Keep Talking 下から、ま、何人かまだまだ来るっていうあのメッセージが来たのでもうちょっと待ちますすみません、うんすみません、We're actually gonna はじめましょう right now. We're gonna get started. <laughs> It's my Sikoshi in Hongo.、Um, Alright, l so welcome to. Don't laugh, this is.、Uh, welcome to、uh, our demo day. Welcome to the Code Crystalis demo day.、Uh, this is cohort four.、Um, and this is actually, we are nearing our one year anniversary.、Um, it's gonna be next week. July 3rd was when our very first class started. Yeah, so today we have six awesome students、um, who are going to be presenting their solo projects as well as their team projects.、Um, before I get started, I、uh, just want to say some thanks.、Uh, these past two weeks have been kind of crazy for us. We got the most publicity we'd ever gotten、um, in Reuters and Japan Times.、So, That wouldn't be possible without our amazing team.、Um, so,、uh, Felix, Kani, Dylan, Mary, Fatima, where are you guys? Thank you guys so much.、Uh, you guys work your butts off、um, making this school、uh, Code Chrysalis, and we thank you very much.、Um, also, we have four awesome interns with us today. Uh, Tan and Blake, and then also who you met downstairs, Aya and Nate.、Um, they have been amazing as well.、Um, so, before we get started,、uh, I want to invite up to the stage、uh, Zach Brown, who is the director of Pivotal Labs Tokyo, to give some remarks about Pivotal. Thank you. Hi, everybody, welcome. There's a lot of people in here, and that is great. So, my name is Zach, and I'm the director of Pivotal Labs Tokyo. In case you're not familiar with Pivotal Labs, we are an agile consultancy,、uh, and we are focused on enablement.、Um, enablement of our customers to build software, build meaningful software quickly, extremely fast. And we do that by using lean and extreme programming or XP. So, most of you probably know extreme programming、uh, came out with this concept that code review is good, and if you take that to the extreme, then constant code review is even better. And so, you have a pair of people, two people, doing programming together, with one person driving, the other person navigating. And、uh, so, Pivotal Labs has been pair programming for, for many, many years. And in that time, we realized that pair programming or pairing is not only good for programmers, but it's actually a great way to share context for everybody on the entire product team. So, we pair product managers, we pair designers, we pair engineers. And the way we work is we pair pivotal folks with our client, and、uh, we're able to、uh, build a real piece of software together, something with, that delivers real business value or solves real business problems. And,、uh, and that's how we, we really teach this way, we teach this method.、Um, so, more broadly speaking, just a little bit about pivotal we're big contributors to open source.、Um, We have、uh, commercial releases of lots of popular open source software as well. 
So uh, we've, we're engaged in the Cloud Foundry community. If you're aware of Cloud Foundry, it's a uh, cloud-based application platform, um, as well as Kubernetes, uh, the Spring Framework for Java, and uh, quite a few other projects, not least of all is Pivotal Tracker. All of that stuff is a bunch of platform and tools. And then, so we also bring this culture and process from Pivotal Labs, and we're effectively a one-stop shop for digital transformation. So anyway, Pivotal are big supporters of the local community, and we're, we're great friends and uh, supporters of uh, Code Chrysalis. So we are extremely happy to have you all here in our facility tonight. And uh, I, I don't know about you all, but I'm really excited to see these, uh, these uh, demo projects that are coming up from the, from the current cohort. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Thank you. Master of Ceremonies, Mike Donnelly, who is a current student, and he'll be the one introducing. Thank you. So, yeah, I've been asked to uh, MC the student portion of the uh, presentations tonight, which is all of it. So, um, <laughs> the uh, first three presentations we're going to see, we uh, during week six of the Coding Immersive, we were asked to build a minimum viable product. Uh, using all of the knowledge we gained in the first five weeks. And we had about two and a half days to build something, and the uh, limitations were, were fairly broad on this. It, it had to have a certain amount of complexity, um, but uh, we could go and build a, uh, a, an app on a phone or a full stack JavaScript application, anything along those lines. So the first MVP that we're going to see tonight is from Alex, uh, hailing all the way from Wall's End. <laughs> and uh, he's going to answer the question, uh, am I nice? <laughs> okay, give me one second. Thank you very much for uh, waiting. So I'm very uh, pleased to be the first presenter for this evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming down to Pivotal to see us tonight. Uh, this is my app, Am I Nice? It seeks to answer that question, are you a nice person? It does that with sentiment analysis of social posts. What does that mean? Well, I'll get into that in just a second. First of all, let's find out uh, who I am. My name is Alexander Ogilvy. Uh, please call me Alex. Uh, I came to Japan about four years ago uh, to become an English teacher in an elementary school. Uh, that was a lot of fun, but I've decided recently that I'm looking for a career change. Around about the same time I started feeling that way, I went to a meetup at Code Chrysalis called Intro to JavaScript. That was just about a year ago. Uh, I fell in love with coding. It was so much fun. Uh, I started to study coding by myself. I raised myself up to the level where I'd be accepted into the boot camp. And here we all are, 12 weeks later, ready to show off what we've built together. So, uh, back to the application. How it works is, we download uh, the latest 200 posts from Facebook, we send them all to Google for sentiment analysis, and then we take those posts and we show them on the web page uh, using D3 uh, for visualization. Hey, rather than tell you about it, why don't I just show you? If I swipe over, I can log in with Facebook. My posts are downloaded uh, 25 at a time until we reach 200. Once we've got all of the posts, we send them to Google one by one for sentiment analysis. Each one goes to Google, it comes back, we get a score from somewhere between one for very positive and negative one for very negative. We then take all of those results, figure out uh, how many are positive, how many are negative, how many are kind of in the middle, and we pick out the number one positive post and the number one negative post as well. 
I can see the, uh, the other students looking nervously at my demo because we all depend on a fast internet speed for this to be a good evening tonight. But we'll see if my results come back. If not, I do have one that I prepared earlier. Uh, all right, I'm going to switch over. I have a preloaded set of results here. This is how it looks when it comes back. You can see uh, I'm 50% positive, uh, not very negative at all, and the rest is neutral. Is that one finished yet? Yes, that one just came back as well. You can see it's the same. So, uh, those posts. Uh, the most positive one was from a beautiful day in Maranouchi. Uh, I was enjoying the sunshine. The most negative one is from the night before I left the UK. My colleagues thought it would be fun to put a lot of dominoes into my beer while I went to the bathroom. That was truly the worst pizza I had ever eaten. So, one more time, uh, to explain how my application works, I get all of the posts from Facebook. I send them all to uh, Google Natural Language Processing for sentiment analysis. I pass through the results and then I show it up on the web page in a beautiful pie chart. Uh, the challenges when I was making this application, uh, there were a few. Uh, creating an express server from scratch was a big challenge. There are very simple ways to create an express server. You can do it uh, automatically, but it gives you a lot of files that you might not necessarily want. Uh, in my case, that I didn't understand, so I wanted to take it upon myself to build it from scratch and understand exactly what was going on. Uh, using Webpack was uh, a challenge. If you've ever used Webpack before, then you know what I'm talking about. It's supposed to be zero configuration, but it's most certainly not. Uh, Facebook login requires HTTPS. Uh, so developing on my own computer, I had to self-sign a certificate and uh, get my browser to trust that certificate. That was a bit of a road, roadblock on the way. Uh, Twitter's API is very restrictive. I originally wanted to do this project with tweets because they're fixed length and a little more emotional, and you could get somebody else's tweets. But recently, the Twitter API has become very restrictive. Uh, you have to pay a lot of money. You have to get verified by Twitter before you can do anything. It's really unfriendly for the hobby developer. Uh, you, this was the first project that I used Heroku to host, uh, and Heroku is really magical. You just give it the files, and uh, 30 seconds later, you've got a website. It's really a great service. And it was fantastic to learn exactly how that works. And the last challenge was this, Facebook app review. To be able to use a user's posts, you have to get a special permission from Facebook. So I submitted this app review in the middle of May, and I finally got a response from them yesterday, six <coughs> weeks later. The response said, it all looks great. Thank you very much. We trust that you're not, being, uh, not doing anything bad. Now just please send us your business license and we can give you the, the, the permissions you need. Of course I don't have a business, so that was the end of that story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you do want to use my application, I can add you as a test user, you can still uh, use it. Just send me an email. Uh, very quickly, the technologies that I used, uh, it's hosted on Heroku. I uh, use an express server for serving the front end and for the back end calls to Google. Uh, I used Facebook login and the Facebook Graph API to get the posts. Google Cloud Natural Language API for sentiment analysis, D3.js for the pie chart, and MarketChai sign-on for testing. The bold technologies are the ones that I had never used before. They were a lot of fun to get my teeth into and to learn how to use them. So thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to use my application, the address is here, or scan the QR code. Please look me up on GitHub, look me up on LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, let's talk after the presentations. Thank you very much. for you about his solo MVP. Mike. All right, I'm going to do the same thing that uh, Alex had to do. Okay. Okay, so uh, I am presenting the second MVP of the evening, and my application is a simple question answered simply, what the heck should I read? Uh, basically, if you are looking for a title to read, it serves back a random book title um, inspired by some other similar things. Let's see. 
There we go. All right. So before I get into that, though, a little bit about myself. Um, I am a full stack engineer with uh, primarily uh, experience over the last several years uh, in the database realm, database engineering, database architect, uh, DBA once upon a time, and uh, again, uh, primarily on the Microsoft stack. So we moved to uh, Tokyo a few years back and continued to work uh, in uh, the database realm, mostly for clients back in uh, Minnesota in the United States. Uh, recently had a chance to take a break and learn some new things and uh, moving into the full stack engineering role. So there's my Twitter handle, I'm fairly active there, and my email. All right, so what the heck should I demo? Let's just go right into it. So we were asked to build a uh, MVP, so I created a very simple looking application that serves back a title from the New York Times API, and when I click the button, it uh, goes out using the New York Times uh, bestsellers API and grabs a random book title from their list uh, over the last nine years or so. So not a whole lot uh, else to explain there. It does what it says it's supposed to do. Um, but you know, we had a little bit more time, and uh, so the first application there that we were looking at is actually running locally on my machine in a Docker container. Uh, this one is uh, deployed out to Heroku, and it's a full, uh, full stack application with a Node Express backend and, and a React front end. Um, added some pictures in, uh, used uh, the Google Books API to grab the picture, so there's actually two, two APIs running here. And uh, if we want to click the button, and hopefully the network is uh, playing nice with us right now, and it goes out and grabs another title. So we can uh, find books that we want to read. And that is, answers the question, what the heck should you read right now? <laughs> we'll go back to the demo. So some of the challenges along the way, um, the, deciding what to do. So we were, they, they said, go and build something. You got about two and a half days. And we all sat down and did brainstorming for uh, well, about an hour, maybe more, and came up with a ton of different ideas. And this is one that uh, somebody threw out there, and I really liked it. Uh, I do read a lot. I was a manager at a bookstore for several years. And the idea of creating something around books was exciting to me, so I decided I would do it. Create what the heck should I read? Um, but we had built uh, a few applications at this point using that full stack uh, JS, you know, Node Express, React, and I thought, well, uh, what's the learning opportunity I get out onto this? And I decided to uh, put the Node server in a Docker container. Um, so then the learning ramp for learning Docker, which I'd never used before, and then the first application with Docker, and then the second to React application with Docker, Do Docker. <laughs> um, and also, this was, you know, uh, you have to start somewhere. This is the first application I had to uh, design on my own with backend configurations, the a API keys for both the New York Times and Google Books. I didn't want to expose those, so I had to store those as environment variables. Um, the last one on there is an ongoing challenge. Um, trying to uh, get the uh, Heroku container registry to accept my image and actually deploy the Docker image on Heroku instead of just deploying it as an application. Uh, and I hope I have some time to look into that now that the course is over. So I talked a lot about Docker. So real quick, if that's not something you're familiar with, I wasn't going into it a whole lot. I had used virtual machines before, which is sort of a, a, a complete uh, operating system and not a container but a complete machine that you can put applications on and sort of move them around easily. Uh, but Docker is much more flexible. It is uh, a, you know, a place where you can put just your application. Uh, well, Docker itself is a, a container platform, I guess, and the containers on there are uh, very useful. I just grabbed one that already had uh, node an, a node image and added my application to it. Um, Docker Compose is probably more for an application that has multiple containers, uh, but I actually found it quite useful even though I only had a single container in the application. Uh, it, it made it much easier to spin it up and stop it and start it again, as well as to add in those configurations that I was talking about for the APIs uh, using a YAML script with Docker Compose. So what the heck did I learn as well? I, it reinforced the knowledge I had on Node Express and React, but in particular React. Uh, it isn't, it isn't uh, overly complex, but uh, building that one from scratch, it was the first solo project that I'd done uh, creating that React front end. And I learned a lot about the New York Times uh, Developer Network API, which uh, came in uh, handy later, as you'll see. Uh, the Google Books API, uh, again, uh, environmental variables. And this is the first uh, application where I, I chose to use the Axios library instead of just uh, plain vanilla fetch. So I got to learn about that. 
A few things that I might add when I go back to this is I'd like to store a little bit of user information, like what things don't you like or what books have you already read so I'm not serving up the same thing. Uh, maybe add some filters, just buttons across there. I, don't, I only want nonfiction or fiction, or I don't want uh, books that have certain words in the title. Um, there is a, a sort of a workaround right now in the application for the New York Times API. It serves back bad data occasionally, so I just say go call it again if I get bad data. Uh, if I have more time, I can dig into that. Uh, and I would like to add uh, bookmarks so that if you see a book that you do like but you want to get some more titles, you can uh, track which ones uh, you want to read later. So that is what the heck should I read now. And uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions about that, uh, find me later, and uh, I'll be glad to talk to you. So going on, we have... <laughs> We have one more MVP, and that is going to be from Gia, and he's going to be taking some pictures. All yours. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I will be the last one who we are going to present our minimal viable product this night. <clears throat> My product is named with memory map. But before go into the product, I want to spend a little time on myself. My name is Jia. Uh, I, uh, I was a DevOps engineer uh, in a small team where we pioneered and designed a building pipeline using Jenkins and Docker, where we learned a lot. Uh, starting from this April, uh, we, uh, I was a student at Code Chrysalis, where we managed to go through a full stack web development journey and where we learned a huge amount of uh, knowledge. Recently, I have been more interested in Kubernetes and uh, serverless. And uh, so, that's about me. Uh, my product is named with memory map. So what does it do? It, gives, uh, it enables the user to select photos, upload those, and tell my app where does this photo was taken. And then a user will see all those photos being painted on a Google map. Uh, let's do a short demo here. I have it opened here uh, at memory-map-cc. I have two tabs on the, on the upper uh, side. We have upload, which looks like this. If we click current map, we can see we already have some photos around the world. <laughs> Let's go back to upload. If we tap this uh, area, click take photo, I'm going to take a selfie. Yay! I will use this photo. And where are we? We are at Pivotal, Japan. And you can upload multiple photos at once. Uh, but uh, here I will just upload this one. Upload submitted. I'm waiting for. Yes, upload success. It said. Uh, if we go back to our map, you can see the photo we just take. Yeah, that's about my uh, my application. And uh, I want to talk about the text stack I was using. This is a full stack JavaScript application and is deployed on Google Cloud Platform. Some keywords about the technologies I have used. On front end, it's uh, React, and uh, I was using Redux to manage my state. Uh, I was using uh, Redux Sunk to do some asynchronized action dispatch. If you have ever experienced uh, Redux, you should know what I'm talking about. And I'm using React Router to do some client-side routing, which I will explain later. On server side, I was using a middleware called Mouter to handle file uploading. On Google Cloud, I was using Google Geo Coding API to get the locations of the, from that string user gave me. Uh, some challenges. The first challenge is, uh, when we built this application like six weeks ago, I had a lot of credit on Google Cloud Platform. So I just spin up a VM, VM, which is named Compute Engine. It's just a VM. You can SSH in, do whatever you can do on your local machine. You can just start a developer server, 
opens a port and pretend that you have deployed your application. However, my credit expired like five days ago, and that's the moment I decided to go serverless. I abandoned, uh, I, um, my application used to deploy in a bad way, and I have to change a lot to make that work, uh, work with Google App Engine, which is a serverless uh, product on Google Cloud Platform. It enables you to do zero server configuration, and uh, it scales as you want. That's pretty awesome. Second, uh, second, uh, uh, the second challenge is uh, client-side routing. There is some concept becoming, uh, becoming really popular called progressive web applications. Uh, among many features of PWA, one of those is the app should be able to work without an internet connect, uh, connection. And being able to do client-side routing is a big fact in one of this. I was using React Router uh, in my application, so if you switch those two tabs, there is no request sent to the server. And uh, to make that happen, I have to set up on both server side and client side. That was a challenge. Some other challenges, where to do the upload, where to get the geocoding, and where, how to serve those static files. There were so many uh, things, uh, so many places that things, uh, those things could be done. And I have to consider those pros and cons, and consider all the trade-offs I have to make, and uh, that was a lot of challenges. That would be all my presentation, and thanks very much for your attention. And I will give it back to Mike. So uh, those three applications that we just saw, we each built in a matter of uh, a couple of days. So uh, they, they are truly MVPs, but actually they all turned out pretty nice, I think. So for the next three presentations, uh, we had a week, uh, week eight, I believe, that was our polyglottal week. And Code Chrysalis asked us to all learn a new language that we had never used before and learn it from scratch within a week build something, and then present it back to the rest of our classmates. So we, oh, we all did this, and we, uh, we, we're going to see three of those presentations uh, involving Kotlin, Rust, and Golang. So I'm going to, uh, remember this was all done in a week. I'm going to turn this over to Taka, and he's going to uh, play us some music. Thank you, Mike. And uh, at the first time, it connects with the Android application. All right, thank you for coming today. From here, I'll introduce about the music player with, uh, made by the Android. And uh, at the first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Takahiro Morita. And I started my career as an industrial engineer. Uh, while working, I got several tasks to program. And uh, while doing that, I found, wow, programming is so fun. And why don't you change to my career in the programmer? And I taught myself to become a programmer, but I still couldn't find it. So I went to the web-related industry to become a SEO specialist. And while doing that, I got applied in the code criticalist and learned a lot to become a programmer. Okay, I think this is enough to introduce myself. And uh, I want to talk about the motivation, why I chose to make, uh, make a music player with Kotlin. And at first, the, during this program, we uh, made several applications using uh, web-related things. So I wanted to create a mobile application. And uh, the another reason is that According to the Stack Overs uh, survey on uh, 2018, the, <coughs> the, mo excuse me, the most loved language in the second is the Kotlin, so I wanted to use it. And uh, let's go to demo. And uh, before going to demo, it takes for a while, so I have a small quiz to you. And the quiz is that you are a programmer and you are going to the bar. 
And uh, but you went you <laughs> you went out uh, immediately. Why? Please find the reason. I will give you the for ten seconds. It's ready. Uh, <laughs> does anyone find the answer? Oh, Horrible please. music. Horrible music. Ah, that's not a good answer. <laughs> but my answer is there is no table. <laughs> ah, yes, I should have mentioned because of a database engineer went to the bar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, ready to play music. Uh, there are several songs. Does anyone have any preference to choose a song? <laughs> I will show the song. Yoshida Kyoda. Yoshida Kyoda. Uh, which one? Yoshida Kyoda. Psycho. Psycho. Yoshida Brothers. Oh, Yoshida Brothers. Oh, this one. Ah, uh, no, it's working. <laughs> yeah, this is demo. <laughs> All right, it's working fine. And I'd like to go back in my slides. All right, it's ready. Then I go, <laughs> I'd like to introduce about the architecture. It's and uh, you open the application and uh, immediately accessing the external storage, it's in this case the micro SD card, and you can see the, the application load up the, all of the songs, and you can choose a song like me, like I did, and uh, now ready to play music. It's very pretty straightforward, and this is application. And the next, the, the challenges which I faced is uh, at first, Kotlin is so compiling, like, uh, in Java, because it uh, it compiles into the uh, bytecode, and it takes uh, like uh, four seconds. And uh, another one is syntax of Kotlin and Android. Yeah, because this is a polyglot project, I need to learn the new language. And another one is external storage access permission. Be, uh, without ha without having the uh, a permission, you cannot get a grant of the uh, to access in the external storage. And the last one is a new concept, such as notable and Elvis operator. Since in this program, I learned a lot in, about the Java, JavaScript. But in JavaScript, it, that, this kind of a concept doesn't exist. And uh, also, I'd like to talk about Kotlin. And Kotlin is invented by the Jet Brains in 2018, 2010, excuse me. And uh, it's general purpose language. So, in, uh, not only the mobile development, you can also to use it, this language to create uh, web applications. And uh, it's open source uh, language, so yes, you don't need to pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's statically typed and object-oriented and functional programming. And uh, if you get familiar with the JavaScript and uh, this kind of concept exists, so you can, the learning cost will be, become decrease. And the last one is now safety. And this is very important concept in the Kotlin, so I want to take a look a bit. Because uh, the now, now reference is always the uh, very big problem to, to create application. So without, uh, without uh, uh, question declaring the uh, variable, without question mark, uh, it's going to show the uh, compilation error to if you assign that now. <laughs> And to, to support a now, you need to declare a uh, variable with question mark. Yeah, this is the, this is the reason why the Kotlin is, can say, the no safety language. And that's all to my presentation. Thank you for taking time.
Oh, oh. And next one is my polyglottal project. Uh, the name is GitHub Issues Viewer with Rust and WebAssembly. Uh, before starting that, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Yusuke Hayashi. Uh, my career as an engineer uh, started uh, in uh, Japanese researching institute, NAOJ, um, uh, with my background of mathematics. And there, there, I was a database engineer, and I wrote some uh, tools for database, uh, like using database or creating new database or uh, visualizing data, uh, mainly with Python. And after that, I wanted to uh, specialize uh, my career as an engineer, so uh, I uh, created that and uh, uh, became a software freelancer. And I wanted to uh, join more international environments, so I'm here in Code Criticize. And uh, here is uh, my uh, content of my presentation. Uh, I guess some of you are already familiar with uh, first three things, but I am happy if you get some idea for these four uh, questions. What is Rust, WebAssembly, uh, GitHub issues, and uh, what is my application? And at first, what is Rust? Uh, Rust is an open source uh, programming language, uh, which is mainly uh, developed by a uh, developer in Mozilla. Mozilla is a company who uh, created, uh, uh, who creating a uh, uh, browser, uh, Firefox, and uh, first appeared in 2010. And it has similar syntax to uh, C++. Uh, you know, uh, C++ is a little uh, difficult language, and uh, we can easily uh, make uh, some mistake around their uh, memory or uh, security things, but uh, Rust has a strict uh, grammar, so uh, it's, uh, we can uh, make robust uh, code with Rust. And so, uh, we, uh, it can be a replacement of uh, C++, or C++. Uh, it means we can write uh, operating system or some kind of uh, low-level uh, programming with Rust. And, uh, uh, this is one reason uh, Mozilla is developing uh, Rust. Uh, Firefox is uh, made with Rust. And uh, Rust is a um, most loved uh, language by developers, uh, according to survey uh, in uh, Stack Overflow. Yeah. And then, what is WebAssembly? A uh, browser can run JavaScript, of course, but also uh, uh, it can run uh, WebAssembly, and it's really new feature. Uh, it uh, officially shows uh, uh, on uh, March last year, and uh, now uh, all major browsers can uh, support that, like uh, <coughs> Chrome, uh, Safari, uh, Edge, uh, uh, Opera, and Internet Explorer. Oh, no, uh, no, Internet Explorer is not supporting that, sorry. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know. and um, it is a uh, binary format language, so if you are a normal human, uh, you cannot read that and you cannot write that in, uh, with binary. But uh, we can write C or C++ or Rust or Golang, and uh, we can compile it into WebAssembly. And the most important thing about uh, WebAssembly is it's really fast and, uh, compared with uh, JavaScript. Some article says uh, some program can be run uh, uh, three times, 30 times faster than JavaScript. Okay, then uh, what is uh, GitHub issues? Uh, some of you are already familiar with that, I think. So let's see what is this. Uh, this is an uh, example of uh, GitHub issues. Uh, when we uh, create some program and uh, we manage it with GitHub, uh, we use sometimes GitHub issues. Uh, with GitHub issues, we can manage uh, some problem about uh, around our code or we can manage uh, progress of our prog uh, programs. 
And uh, I think uh, if there are some way to see this, uh, it's very good for JavaPath. So that's why I create this application. So let's see what is my application. Uh, my application solves uh, GitHub issues uh, with Spanish CSS, and we uh, can see the content without clicking. And Uh, it's built with Rust and compiled into WebAssembly. And there are a uh, good library named Vue. Uh, with it, uh, we can write uh, uh, like uh, React like uh, 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 with React like structure. So we can write front end code with Rust with you. And uh, because it's just a front-end call, so uh, I, it's just posted on GitHub pages. So let's see uh, the demo. <coughs> this is my uh, application, uh, GitHub issues. And when we write the uh, <coughs> GitHub username and GitHub repository name, and click this, then it fetches the contents. There's a typo. Yeah. Typo. -E oh, thank you. Oh. Oh, it counts. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you can see the uh, title and content of that. But uh, there is uh, some problem about content. Uh, it shows just uh, HTML because uh, it's uh, originally it's just a, a Markdown uh, structure. And uh, U is very really new library, and there was a problem uh, when I created this. And uh, but uh, currently, I find uh, they uh, solved the problem around uh, Markdown uh, just uh, six days ago. So if I have a time, uh, I will fix this part. Okay, uh, let's see what I did in this pro uh, this project. Uh, this is a VS Code, and the uh, right side, right column is uh, pretty much all what I wrote uh, files. And uh, there are two Rust files, uh, lib.rs and main.rs. And there are no JavaScript, just uh, index.html and style.css. And we can uh, manage uh, dependencies with uh, cargo. Uh, which is uh, Rust package manager, and with this command curve web build, uh, we can uh, compile uh, Rust language into WebAssembly. So let's see uh, the code of Rust and WebAssembly. Uh, Rust uh, is like this. Uh, it's uh, if you have some experience with React. Uh, you can see it is very similar to that because uh, we uh, you, I use U <coughs> library and uh, let's see WebAssembly code. If you open that with VS Code, you can see this uh, text. Do you want to open it anyway? Because uh, it's binary. Then I uh, click that. Uh, it shows like this. But if you uh, 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 install some add-on, you can see the content uh, with a little bit easy to read structure, but still uh, hard. And uh, the lines, uh, number of lines are uh, like uh, 4 million, uh, uh, even if I just wrote uh, 200 or uh, small source code. Uh, that's pretty much all uh, my presentation. Thank you. Next person is bonus. <laughs> Please come here and it's your round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. 
I am the sixth of the solo projects. Welcome to the bonus round. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my polyglottal project. I learned Golang in five days and built a simple web app, so I'd like to share that with you. Uh, first, about me, my name is Bo Dobbin. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S. I was a musician and an audio engineer for many, year for many years. Um, I moved to Korea to teach English in an elementary school. After that, I moved to Japan to teach English in a, a Kaiwa. At my English school, I found that I was really interested in computer programming, so I decided to change my careers, and that brought me to Code Chrysalis today. So, let's see. About Go, um, I was attracted to Go because it's very easy to get started. One line to install, and the websites are very, very good. The, uh, the website, the official Golang Hub, has a lot of information. The documentation is pretty good, and the interactive sandbox is a great way to learn getting uh, using uh, code and with your, your uh, hands-on experience. Uh, for example, Hello World and Go. Uh, as you can see here, every, every file in Go belongs to a package, and every program needs a main method for the entry point. Um, but what's really cool is the compilation and running is just one line. So what this line does is it makes a temporary binary and executes it for you. So you don't have to mess with multiple commands to compile. It's really cool. Uh, we've been using JavaScript a lot in our school. So I'd like to compare it with, uh, with Golang to kind of see some of the main differences I noticed. Both of them have excellent garbage collection. They both allow you to do functional programming. Um, you can do out-of-the-box HTTP servers with both languages very easily. But some of the features that Golang had that I thought were different than JavaScript were pointers. Uh, I used those in my code. I'll explain that a little later. Um, it has strong typing, and it also has type inference. So I'll give an, an example of that later, too. Um, it has out-of-the-box testing and benchmarks, which really help you to optimize your code and see where you need to fix things. It's also very fast to build and compile, so I was very impressed. My approach to this project it was to learn Hello World, which was quite easy. I did the Go tour on the Google website there. There's also a great website, Go by Example, that gives lots of examples for all the syntax in Go. I made a Hello World HTTP server. Then I thought, what do I want to do? Well, I'm really interested in cryptography, so I wanted to write a cryptography algorithm. Uh, the first one I did was a Caesar cipher. I'll explain that also in a moment. Then I figured out how to do testing. Once I got the test working for that, I chose another algorithm, which is called the Skittily cipher. And then I wanted to figure out how to modularize my code so it would be easy to add more uh, algorithms in the future. Once I did that, I wanted to refactor to use some of the cool Golang features. For example, with pointers, I was able to use the same code for encryption and decryption. I just passed the arguments a little bit differently, and I didn't have to rewrite the code. It was very cool. Here is a demo. Uh, my, my website, or my web app, is called Pretty Sweet Crypto Suite. It looks like this. Uh, I'll zoom in so we can see it a little better. This first cipher is called a Caesar cipher, or a shift cipher. Uh, the alphabet, you can see at the top, what you do is you write a message in the alphabet and you shift it to the left or the right. In this example, the alphabet is shifted to the left, so an E becomes a B. Uh, so I will demonstrate how this works here. So uh, just a minute, I'm going to try this. If I write the word yes, and I'm going to shift that to the left three, any guesses on what it might be? Yes. I'll give you a few seconds. And uh, let's see. Hmm, what do you think? Anybody get it right? VBP? Yeah? Okay. No, I know. That was very fast. Let's see. So that's how it works. And if I take VBP here, of course, and I shift it to the, the right three, then we get, ooh, excuse me, uh, the right three, pardon me, VBP, shift it to the right three, we get back to yes. Very good. So that's a simple shift cipher. The next one is not a sky tail, but a skittily cipher. This is very old. It's, uh, it's from when people used a cylindrical rod. They would wrap a piece of leather around the rod, write their message naturally, unwrap, unwrap the leather, and then the encrypted message would be written on the leather. So for example, I can take this paragraph here. If I put that in here as my plain text message, let's imagine the skittily had six sides. If I encrypt that, 
I get this mess of nonsense. But that's good if you don't want anyone to know what it says. So I can then take the message here, use the, uh, I'm going to use a different number of sides. So if I use the wrong number, it's still nonsense. But of course, if I use the correct number, we get back to the original message. So that's the skittily cipher. Uh, let's see, go back here. Once, uh, so let me tell you a little more about the language itself. Uh, I was really impressed by the types in Go. There are quite a few types. The, the rune in particular was very interesting. It allows you to uh, parse a string, and each character can have a different encoding, but you don't have to rewrite your code. The rune iterates over the string. It doesn't matter what the encoding is. At the bottom, you see an example of explicit type declaration. But you can also infer the type without writing any, any type keywords. So that saves your fingers on the keyboard. You don't have to write so much. Very cool indeed. This is an example of uh, how a web server in Go looks compared to a web server in JavaScript. Uh, very similar to JavaScript, you just you start a router, you define your routes, and you can send a function that will handle the traffic to that particular route. Very, very easy to get started. Uh, my most, uh, my favorite uh, feature of Golang was the testing. Uh, this is all out of the box. You don't have to use any external libraries. Uh, one line will test all of your code if you write your test properly. But this one is really cool because it tells you how many nanoseconds per, uh, per test case it takes, how many bytes of memory you're using, and how many memory allocations. So it really helps you to optimize your code. So that is all about my pretty sweet crypto suite. Thank you very much for your time, and if you'd like to nerd out and talk about cryptography, please chat with me after the presentation. Thank you. Some great applications built, and I hope you guys uh, had fun learning about uh, some of the top trending languages, as much fun we had that week learning about them as well. So we're going to move next into our uh, team projects, our final projects for the Code Chrysalis experience. And we have two teams of three that uh, we, we split up into and each built an application. The first team, uh, if you guys want to come up and plug in, and uh, it's going to be Alex, Yusuke, and Taka. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to like this uh, presentation. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's a shoo-in. to introduce our team project. The name is Shuin. The name Shuin comes from the Japanese word that collects stamps. And by the, uh, this project is made by the Alex. You say this project is uh, available from this QR code. So if you are interested in, please download it. And what is stamp rally, by the way? The stamp rally is very famous activity in Japan. In Japan. For, especially for kids and youth. The, this event is to collect the stamps in your know, booklet, and after collecting all of the stamps, you can get uh, prizes. And when I was a kid, I went to the aquarium and going to the each sections and collecting the animal stamps. And I, after that, I got a prize as a, I, I got a prize as a, uh, what's that? The stationery. The why do people love stamp rallies? Of course, for users, uh, it was it is really fun. Uh, with a stamp rally, uh, user can go many uh, places uh, if there is a goal for that. And uh, collecting stamp is also fun. And sometimes a user can receive some prizes uh, for exchange of uh, completed card. And then, what company uh, make some uh, stamp rallies? Uh, they want it, want to uh, advertise themselves and uh, they uh, sometimes want people to come to uh, many uh, their places uh, because uh, people can pay money just uh, buying food or drink or a souvenir or just for uh, transportation. 
So uh, if there is an uh, easy way to create new stamp rallies, uh, it's really good. So that's why we create this application. So let's get right into the demonstration. Let's take a look at our application. So there are two users here tonight. One of them is Taka. Uh, he is the corporate user. He's going to create a stamp rally for us. The other is Yusuke. He is a consumer. He's going to do the stamp rally. So, first of all, Taka logs in with his uh, social account to be able to access the Stamp Rally creation website. Uh, he's already created a couple of rallies, but let's go ahead and create a new one uh, for the occasion. So, he can see a map, he can see where he is now, and he can search for places to place a new stamp. Uh, since we're here, why don't we place one right here at Pivotal? Cool. Uh, he can type in the title of the stamp, he can type in the description. Is everything okay? Cool. Uh, he can add the stamp to the rally once he's satisfied with what he has entered. He can also, uh, when he's created all of the stamps, he can add a title for the rally itself, add a description for the rally itself, he can set a time limit so, for example, a rally might be available for a whole month, or a whole year, or just a single week, and that would definitely encourage uh, people to, create, to complete that rally a little more quickly. Now let's place one more stamp on um, Code Chrysalis. It's just down the road from here. If you've never been, then please uh, head on down, collect the stamp, and say hello to uh, Kanye and Jan while you're there, and come and learn a little bit about our boot camp. So we've got our two stamps now in the rally. We'll just add a title. How about software stamps? Very nice. And once we have finished filling out the details, we just simply hit the submit button and our rally is added to the server available for anyone to participate in. So now we'll switch over to the use case part of the demo. So he will be the consumer of the application he's going to uh, collect the stamps from the rally that we just created. So, here we are. You can see the list of available rallies. You can see the rallies that he's currently participating in and the rallies that he's completed. And if he pulls down, he can refresh the list and hopefully get access to the new rally we just created here, Software Stamps. So we go ahead and select that, that Software Stamps rally. We've got the two stamps available to us today. Uh, because this is a demo, we've set the collection range to 5,000 meters. So hopefully we'll be able to collect both of these stamps. So if you pick, pick, uh, pick one of the stamps, Yusuke, and collect it. Okay. Cool. Okay, how does that feel, Yusuke? Super fun! Great. <laughs> Let's uh, collect the code chrysalis stamp while we're at it. Yay. Once we've collected all of the uh, stamps, we get a little pop-up. You've got 50 points. That should bring you to a total of 150. So that's the end of our demonstration. Let's get back into the presentation. Just takes a second for the Apple TV to switch back over. Okay. So we've got a diagram here showing the technologies that we use to build this little application. Uh, the front end is on the left, the back end is on the right. Uh, Yusuke mostly worked on the back end, myself and Taka mostly worked on the front end, but we did help each other out with every part of the application. We created a uh, API server and database, and these two things are on Heroku. And with API server, uh, we can do authentic uh, user authentication and creating user and uh, creating new rallies and uh, toggling uh, which rally user choose or which location uh, user already uh, visited. And uh, we choose the uh, Postgres database uh, because uh, there are good add-on on Heroku. And talking about the front-end side in the mobile, we use the React Native and the Expo as a main technology. There are three reasons. The first reason is that we wanted to support both mediums of the Android and the iOS, and the Expo is possible to do that. And the second reason is the, the uh, Expo uh, can take care of our assets automatically without handling by, by ourselves. 
And uh, the third reason is the uh, Expo has uh, some built-in components like a Google Map and the navigations. So that's why we chose uh, uh, React Native and the Expo. And the web front end is created by the React because uh, it's cutting, te cut cutting edge technologies. So why don't we try to use this technology? So we faced a lot of challenges, of course, when we were building this application. We managed to overcome them. Uh, the first challenge, uh, React Native. We had never used React Native before. We had used React before, so we were familiar with the ideas behind the, 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 the library, but we had never used React Native before. So using that was a, a nice new challenge. Uh, debugging was, it was tricky because my iPhone doesn't have a terminal. It's difficult to see what it's logging. So uh, debugging it was, uh, getting that set up was a little difficult. Once we had it set up, it was very, very helpful. And another one is branding. Since we don't have any knowledge about the web designing and the coloring, we took much time to uh, figure out about this part. And another one is geolocations. Since the user is always uh, moving, so we need to keep track of the user locations and to find the nearest lo uh, uh, marker. So we took a time to figure out this part as well. And through uh, this course in Code Criticize, we create many applications with uh, React, but uh, we didn't create any uh, complicated application uh, on mobile. So uh, it's actually hard to find good uh, UX and UI design. And we challenged uh, creating, implementing uh, social authentication with Google account. And we use a passport for web application, and we use built-in library uh, on Expo uh, with our mobile application. So I'll very quickly take you through the project inception. Uh, so we, as part of the Code Chrysalis course, we were lucky enough to come here to Pivotal to learn about agile development, and we tried to apply that a little bit when we were developing our own product. So uh, the first thing we did is we sat down and we came up with a vision for what do we want this product to be. If we had all the money and all the time in the world, what would it end up looking like? Uh, after that, we tried to whittle that down into more reasonable goals. Uh, what could we achieve in four weeks? And non-goals, what would be a little out of the scope of a month? What would be uh, distracting? So we could say right from the start, we're not going to do this. Uh, then we created some personas. These are like uh, imaginary people who might be a typical user for your application. If you don't do this, then you might end up designing an app just for yourself. I mean, we're three guys in our 20s, we're not necessarily the, the target audience. So creating these personas helps to keep the focus on the, the user rather than us. Uh, we created some stories, which is how would the persona feel before, during, and after using the application? And uh, we then created a storyboard. We created this uh, on day one. I hope you can see that uh, it's not so different looking today. We had a clear vision right from the start of how we wanted our application to look. And for future features, we want to create a search filter and a suggestion rallies uh, in order to improve user experience. And we want to uh, implement sharing, uh, social sharing uh, in order to uh, promote our application and we want to record the time until a user completes the rallies for competition and uh, we want to uh, give some reward for rally completion. And the other one is Mataringa support. For now it supports only English so if we support Jap Japanese uh, the more users can uh, use these applications. And another one is uh, billing system. If we get money, so we can get more implementations to create this application more comfortable. And another one is uh, customization for uh, rally creators. For example, uh, there are convenience stores and restaurants, and if they create their own rallies and with their uh, branding images, they can advertise their, uh, their brands as well. And also, the last one is augmented reality, just for fun to excite the users. So that's it uh, from us. Thank you very much for listening. As I said before, if you'd like to give it a try, scan our QR code and you can create your own rallies, download the Android version of our application. We're still in app review on iOS, but if you'd like to be a test user, you can sign up for that on the website there as well. So please check us out on GitHub, check us out on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So uh, before we go on to the next presentation, we do have about five minutes for questions uh, about this presentation. We'll have some sort of general Q&A later on, but if anybody's got any questions about Shuen that they want to ask these guys, uh, raise your hand, I'll run over with my mic and uh, you can ask it. So uh, real quick though too, I wanted to mention uh, something I forgot to say earlier was that the senior projects, these final projects were done in the last about three and a half weeks of the class. So all, everything you're seeing here was done in about uh, three and a half weeks. Any questions for Shuin on their technology, on the uh, idea? All right. Well, so just a quick question for you. Um, I can speak louder. Okay. Can, you, can, <laughs> can they hear me on the webcam? Yeah, can you use yeah, the mic? Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. um, so you chose your stack. Um, is, would you change anything moving forward? Would you, would you take out a piece of the stack and put something else in? And if so, uh, mm -hmm. why? Somebody want to take that or you know, some That's ideas? A great question. Mm. I'll take it. Yep. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, most of the technologies that we used were brand new to us. Uh, we, we chose them uh, because we figured they were the best tools for the job. Um, it was a lot of fun using Expo. I don't know if you've ever used Expo before. It takes care of a lot of the heavy lifting, but it um, it also abstracts away a lot of the, the challenges that come with mobile development. So if we had more time, I would like to rip out React Native and try to build the app from scratch using Swift or using Kotlin to try to get really under the hood of mobile development. Any other questions? <coughs> Well, thank you, Shuen, and uh, we'll move on. <laughs> so the next uh, final project uh, will include, uh, well, it's going to seem like you've seen all of these people before. Um, and myself, Bo, and John will be presenting a product called Deja Vu. Thanks for waiting. Uh, we are going to talk about our uh, final project, which named Deja View. Before going into uh, our project, this is Mike. Hello. This is Robert Archibald Dobbin III, also known as Bonus. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> we are going to talk about uh, what is our project. We are going to do a short demo. Uh, we are going to talk about technologies, architecture we have been using. Also, we are going to cover challenges we have to face. Also, there are some future plans. So before we show you what Deja View exactly is, a little bit behind the inspiration and on why we did it. Um, so the image here you see is a 90 years in weeks. Uh, each row represents a year. And the uh, author, Tim Urban, on his uh, website has an article where he describes this and he talks about being able to look at a particular week and you decide, is it a good week? Is it a bad week? Was it kind of a nothing week where you just watch Netflix for the entire week? Um, and he, he, he uh, goes on to describe maybe creating a journal so this is something you can track. Uh, and a journal is great for going forward and you can kind of see what your weeks are like. But it occurred to us that there's a lot of information out there that we can grab and maybe we could look at our weeks going backwards. So uh, we ended up creating sort of a nostalgia machine. Um, a, a, using publicly available data sources, we created a tool that lets you look at a particular point in your life. Um, you can get the news of the day, the popular songs, and uh, if it happens to be during a period where there was social media existing, uh, you can grab that. Uh, currently we have Facebook. Uh, this is me uh, holding my son uh, shortly after he was born. and. We took it a step further and thought, okay, you can look at a point in your life, you could look at the weeks, you could look at the months or years, or maybe get a glance of your entire life, but then you could also compare it with somebody else's life. So this is me and my father, and our lives have been synced up here to the exact same point, and the ability to see what was going on in my dad's life at the same point I was when I was 29. So that is where we're hoping to take it someday. 
So we'll show you what we have so far in our demo. So uh, first thing, uh, if you would please, Mike. Mike's going to demonstrate for us. Uh, we will log into or go to our landing page. Let's zoom in just a bit, please. So the first thing you see here is a uh, white rectangle. We call this a card. On this card, you see a series of events. Some of these events come from the New York Times. Some of them come from the Billboard Top or Hot 100 number one song. Also, the number one gross, grossing movie. And occasionally, Wikipedia has an entry for on this day. So let's make this a little more interesting. Uh, would anyone care to volunteer their birthday, please? Anyone at all? Uh, yes, you in the back. Uh, 17 August, uh, 1990. Okay, so that was August 17th, 1990. Now, let's make this interesting. Let's go forward. Uh, let's go forward 20 years. And what we're going to do here, yeah, 20 years, so that would be 2010. Yeah, very good. So what I want to do is filter out. Let's look at only the movies and the music. And let's change the, uh, what we call the granularity to just the year. So now each card is just going to show movies and music, one randomly selected top movie and top song from that year. So the, the idea is as you look through this, you get a real feeling of, oh, I remember, this was 12 years ago. I remember when uh, Fergie was on top of the charts. Uh, of course, everyone remembers when Kanye was on top of the charts. It still is a lot of times. So there's one more cool feature I'd like to show you. So if you would, uh, let's go back to today by refreshing. And now what you're going to see on these cards, uh, like I said, we have four sources of information. We're also going to let Mike log into Facebook. So if you click on the Facebook login, it will forward us to Facebook, <clears throat> where uh, Mike is going to log in for us. Um, and his, if you if you know Mike, you know that this. Uh, oh, he's already logged in. So now Facebook has been added to our filters. Let's change. Oh, there we go. So very good. So if you see Mike posted today uh, that we have Code Chrysalis Demo Day at Pivotal. And if you were to scroll down, you would see uh, Facebook posts for each day that Mike was posting on Facebook. So that is our application. And let's continue talking about the, uh, oh, if you click on a, but if you click on a Facebook link, you will see the Facebook uh, post itself. So that is our demo. Let's move right along to the, uh, the development process. Um, so when we had the idea, we wanted to get more creative and come up with more ideas of things to do. So we tried not to filter or criticize anything. We were writing lots of things on paper and post-it notes. And we also uh, wanted to get organized after that and started being more critical of our ideas. Of course, when you build something big, you have to put everything in order. So once we put everything on order, it was easy to see what we should make first. Then we used GitHub issues to kind of organize our tasks and we used milestones to focus on one week or two days at a time of work. When we made assignments to each of us, we at first we tried to alternate who was assigned to what so that we could maintain interest in the, pro in the project, we could learn about different parts of the project, and try to, to get everyone's creativity in all aspects of the project. So, Ja is going to continue now. Uh, during the demo, we have seen that we have we are uh, we are capable of getting New York Times data. We have uh, we have Wikipedia on these state events, and these are the numbers we have in our database. Uh, so, how did we collect all those data? There were two ways we used. The first is via an API. For New York Times case, they already have a public available API. So, all we need to do is making HTTP request collect the JSON files and extract all the information we need and turn them into a card shown on DejaView.cc. The next way of uh, collecting data was by uh, parsing HTML. For example, Wikipedia doesn't have a decent API for on this day event. So we had to use in Python to parse those HTML pages, extract the information we need, and turn them into a card on DejaView.cc. Uh, that's uh, the, how we collected those data. If we have a look about our architecture, so if there are any re uh, requests uh, hit DejaView.cc, uh, a, a DNS record will direct that to Heroku. 
where we host our application. There is a concept called Dino on Heroku, which under the hood is a container, but we don't have to care too much about the scheduling the life cycle. So that's where we deploy our application on. Our application is built with full stack JavaScript. We have React on the front end. We have Express Node on the back end. We use Passport to uh, do all user authentication with Facebook, and Kinex is the tool we use that we talk, uh, to talk to the database. So when Dino wants some information, it has two sources. The first is Facebook. If a user is locked in, clearly it will go to Facebook and fetch those data and serve it, uh, answering those requests. So we are not storing any user data. Another source is RDS, which is a fully managed relational database on AWS. We chose that because the free tier gave us the ability to, to have 20 gigabytes, which already used up. And uh, uh, another reason we chose AWS is we want to automate our data aggregation process. I will explain what's happening every day, and I hope those icons will make sense. So every day, on a predefined time, CloudWatch will trigger our function which is deployed on Lambda. Our function is written in Python, by the way. That function will go, to in, uh, go, uh, go out to internet, collect the, the New York Times article on that day, collect the up-to-date Wikipedia status, calculate the difference, extract all the information we need into database. Also, it will uh, uh, store the raw JSON files in S3, which is object storage. For backup, also, for purpose of a cache, so we don't have to load all 366 days for Wikipedia every day. So we did have some challenges along the way. Um, not any particular nitty-gritty technical challenges, but uh, some design things. Um, Gio was talking about our data aggregation and just the scale of the data. And at the end there, he was referencing the Wikipedia data, uh, which is you know, several thousand records we could be uploading every day. Uh, it's any time in the past somebody could add an event, so we need to look at the whole scope of it. Uh, we basically had to chunk that up so that we could get uh, individual uh, pieces of, from Wikipedia. But in addition just to scale, each data source had sort of its own unique challenges. Um, we're getting data in different ways from different things, um, like the New York Times API, the further back you go, the less reliable the uh, actual headlines and things like that are, uh, and we also realized that the shape of the data changed as we went back in time, so we had to account for that. And Wikipedia, of course, is an open source platform, and so there's not a very consistent uh, style to the things that we were trying uh, to use AT, uh, HTML requests for, so we had to account for things like dashes being one dash or two dash, or that's just a small example. Uh, and on Facebook, uh, Alex talked a little bit about this earlier, the uh, app review process for that. We are still in app review and uh, we, we uh, hope to hear back at some point. But also it was a learning curve for us learning the uh, uh, graph API for them as well. We had some database decisions to make along the way. Um, a lot of our data comes back in JSON format, so we looked at NoSQL briefly, but there were so many different shapes of data and really we needed a simple shape that we could read quickly uh, and also be able to uh, aggregate on. Because we want to switch from that week to month to year very quickly, the database query is doing that for us and we don't have to do that on the front end. So relational database made more sense. Uh, talked about Facebook already. One thing we did run into was a time zone uh, when we're trying to create these different granularities. Um, we wanted to normalize right up front to say, let's use UTC for everything because we're pulling from all these different sources. But the different sources wanted to feed us the local time zone data from that. We ultimately had to fix this, uh, not had to, got to fix this using the Moment library, uh, which handled it quite nicely and was able to convert everything to UTC when, when we're uh, aggregating for those weeks, months, days. So, thank you. I'd like to tell you about our plans for the future. Uh, like Mike said at the beginning, we, we would like to ideally compare two different timelines with two different generations or two people. Uh, we'd like to be able to rank events. Um, right now we're showing random events that appear in a certain time period. Uh, we'd like to maybe show the most important somehow. Um, we, we're interested in adding more data sources like more social media integration, Facebook likes or comments, 
or also Twitter tweets or trends, that would be interesting. Perhaps even uh, location information, if you could see and be reminded when you moved to a different country or when you took a nice vacation, that would be interesting. We'd also like to be able to format the data beautifully so you could maybe share it with your friends or print it out. Uh, those are our future plans. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, check us out at dejavu.cc or any of us at these uh, locations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much like with the previous group, if you guys have any questions about this particular project, uh, we have a few minutes to take those now. Uh, more general questions uh, will be later. So anybody want to know anything about uh, Deja Vu? Um, why did you pick Lambda as opposed to EC2 or some other So the question was, uh, why did we pick Lambda over uh, EC2 or something along those lines? Uh, Jeet, do you want to speak to that? Okay. One thing, as I was saying in my uh, solo project, Go Serverless. Uh, that's one of the reason. Uh, uh, another reason we uh, we we wanted to use serverless because we want to learn something new and exciting. EC2 is was already there. We we know that we'll we will be able to get that done. But the lambda was something new and challenging and we want to learn something. That's that would be the first reason. I, I bet there are other reasons. Yeah, the Python scripts for are fairly lightweight, so using serverless was uh, it just came naturally as a decision, I guess. Also, each data source, it takes uh, either minutes or hours to, to run every day, so we don't want to leave it on all the time. With the Lambda, we were able to just use the electricity that we needed for those calls. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Oh, yeah. We do have one more. Okay. Um, so, I guess right now, we, you guys, the, the study is sort of concluded, right? Yes. Right. So, and this goes for the previous group as well, but uh, are you guys actually uh, serious about continuing this project as a team uh, outside of Code or are you guys continuing it? Code uh, Chris like, like, how serious are you guys about continuing? Sure, so the question is, uh, how serious are we are about continuing our uh, journey into full stack engineers? With this um, project. Uh, but in the project so oh, these particular projects, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, hmm, that is a good question. Uh, this is a passion project of mine, so I could definitely see myself working on it, but uh, there's also going to be a lot of opportunities ahead for us, so time could be a concern. Do you guys have anything to add to that? <laughs> well, uh, so we've been working side by side in the same room for the last few weeks, um, but in the future we'll have to be using remote development. Uh, it's, it sounds like an interesting challenge, and I, I plan to continue. We have a list of issues we like to hack away at. and. Uh, I definitely am interested in, in continuing this. Maybe not eight hours a day like we have been for the last four weeks. Would you like to add anything, John? Um, yeah, uh, it has been a really interesting, uh, interesting process. Uh, before we deployed that thing on AWS, I have to wake up like three a.m. in the morning to continue the, day, the scraping process, and. Uh, uh, that was a lot of fun, but yeah, as Bo and Michael were saying, uh, we probably are not going to be able to work on eight hours side by side, but we, it's, we are going to see ourselves working on that, I think. And so uh, this is actually a great segue, since there's a question for both teams, if you guys want to take the same thing. Yeah, I'll weigh in on that. Um, when we first came up with the idea, we were excited to build it, but we, th we, would, we were just building it because it's, it was a requirement of the course. But the more we built it, and the more we thought about it, we thought, like, this is a really great idea that we have. Um, maybe we could do something with it. We haven't really talked about continuing in the future uh, seriously, but, yeah, it's, it's an exciting project that I would like to see where it could take us. Yeah, uh, I also think uh, this uh, by uh, our application, uh, Stanbury has uh, some. I, I think it's big possibility to monetize it because uh, many company uh, can do uh, ad uh, advertise themselves with uh, Stanbury. I think. Yes, as uh, Alex mentioned, we have never discussed about the future plans to implement this application after graduating this project, a uh, program, excuse me. 
but uh, as long as I know that there is no application in the in the world to you to create uh, their own uh, stamp rallies in to with the companies, so I believe this application has a big potential in the future. So I'd I add one last thing is that uh, both of these projects are currently open source. So if it's something that uh, interests you and you want to contribute to, um, you can check out the GitHub repositories. I, I think, uh, I mean, hopefully that answers the question for you. Uh, there was somebody else who had their hand up. Um, and it, whether it was, was it project specific, uh, either way, I think we could probably go into it. Is there another question we saw in the back? All right. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Yan at this point and uh, let her do some of the talking. Wait, wait, wait oh. a minute. <laughs> this is a surprise. That's right. Uh, before I hand it over to Yan, we do have one last thing. Uh, I can say something so um, we just wanted to say thank you to everyone at Code Chrysalis. This has been a really amazing experience for us. Uh, in particular, uh, before starting Code Chrysalis, I felt like an outsider in the tech world, and they really made me feel like I belong here. So I really appreciate that. Yes, I want to thank uh, everybody at Code Chrysalis for making me uncomfortable over the last 12 weeks and uh, <laughs> really pushing me out of my comfort zone to learn new things. So, uh, Yeah, my thanks would be um, thanks for pushing us all the time. There was not a single day that we can take some rest and say, ah, this is... <laughs> yeah, always, yeah, there was all, always challenging tasks in front of us and I, I'm very grateful for that. Yes, thank you for uh, everyone for supporting us, especially I felt very uncomfortable in this, during this program. And the kind of helped me a lot too, <laughs> uh, be, when becoming the Im imposter syndrome to get more confidence. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you uh, for giving me and everyone here the tools to be able to create new things. I'm not a very creative person. Uh, I can't draw, I can't make music, but with these tools I can be creative, so I want to say thank you for that. Uh, uh, for me, uh, this kind of uh, environment is really new, and I'm really uh, grateful for uh, making me feel uh, welcome. from the audience for our six awesome students, now graduates. All right, oh, one, one over there? Okay, can you, can you uh, uh, shout? Uh, I wanted to, to, to hear more about uh, what do you think about the agile uh, information that you got, the agile training? Do you think that's something really useful that I want to share with everyone and uh, maybe take it for your future projects? Yes. So I'll, uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, is, uh, what, do, what do we think about the Agile training that we got here at Pivotal uh, for two days? Um, does somebody want to take that? I can speak to it otherwise. And, yeah. Um, for me, it was a great experience. I've been working in IT for a, well, a while. And um, <laughs> uh, it's sort of peripheral to anybody doing any serious Agile development, uh, particularly on the database side. It doesn't tend to get treated with the same uh, seriousness. So to have sort of that edge knowledge of it and to be able to put it all together and see how it should be done was a great experience. Uh, and just, I mean, you know, when, when it's all laid out in front of you, it makes so much sense, right? Anybody want to add anything? Uh, yeah, for me, I uh, learned a lot about creativity in general and how to um, use uh, expansive thinking and also focused thinking at the same time and making sure you're considering all ideas but also being very focused on what you're doing all the time so I really appreciate that um, uh, we didn't do it during our two-day visit to Pivotal but we were doing a lot of pair programming at the very beginning of uh, Code Chrysalis uh, if for for someone who uh, who are not familiar with this, it's it, it would be usually two people sitting together, uh, one people navigating, the other people driving, two people working on the same thing at the same time. That's uh, how uh, uh, pair programming was defined, and uh, 
I think that's a huge uh, benefit for knowledge transfer, especially in a company, uh, in, in a company like uh, in a team, like uh, in a middle size, I would say. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely want to try that out in the future. Yeah, um, one of the most important things that I learned during the workshop here at Total was uh, remembering that you're not building the app for yourself. Remembering that you're building it for somebody else. And just because you think it's a cool feature doesn't mean that they will. So that, that, that was what I really took away from the Pivotal visit. Uh, I'd like to say two things. Uh, for me, uh, in Agile development, um, the most important thing I feel is reduce risk uh, uh, with continuous integration, we can reduce a uh, huge risk. And uh, one more thing I would like to say is uh, pair about pair programming. Uh, before uh, doing that, uh, I feel uh, doing something with two person is uh, literally not efficient, e efficient. but uh, after uh, uh, now, I think uh, it's a very efficient way because uh, we can share our uh, current uh, situation and uh, from uh, language uh, we can uh, make uh, our knowledge uh, concrete and uh, yeah I, 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 I now I uh, like uh, development very much uh, for me I do very appreciate from uh, getting the agile development technologies since I have not never I have no uh, knowledge and experience about the programming before coming here so it was very uh, helpful for future uh, future uh, career and about pair programming uh, it's very helpful to uh, to get understanding about each knowledge without um, without this confidence I couldn't uh, get a, getting the drive the, my partner and I couldn't get uh, driving by myself. All right. Oh, uh, more questions. Okay, so these two, and then uh, we, I don't think we'll have time for all of you guys to give an answer. It's a very talkative bunch. Um, we really focus a lot on communication in the course, so it, excuse them, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Oh, um, you talked a lot about languages and APIs and frameworks, but uh, tools are very important to the craft of software engineering and can be very personal. So could you just give some quick insight of the IDEs you used and why you chose them? And uh, did you learn any new ones? Did you choose any new ones specifically? You want to take them? Sure. You go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we used uh, VS Code a lot. Uh, it was the first time I had used VS Code coming to this. Um, I found it to be very fast. Uh, some tricks I learned, uh, learning how to use a debugger helps for a lot of kind of bugs. But other, other uh, I learned about using watch in an, in an interesting way to uh, be able to get instant feedback. It's kind of like hot reloading on, on a command line that you're running. So that was, that was really cool that I learned how to use here. Anyone else? Anyone else? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, so, I'm going to make this a segue question, um, but thank you all very much for the presentations. I think everybody here kind of came from very different, diverse backgrounds uh, for a, you know a shared goal or ambition, and I'd say there's maybe a lot of you know future perspective uh, you know employers here or online or you know many different kind of opportunities that await you all going forward. And I guess the question is you know after having come together with this you know maybe a, a similar vision or goal. Um, now that it's ending and you're looking forward to the next stage of your life, what is, do you all want to be full stack JavaScript engineers or have you realized you want to go back and do something else or what, what, do, um, what do you all see as the, the future, maybe that can shape some of the conversations that, that happen after this uh, session? Take it. Uh, so, yeah, full stack JavaScript engineer sounds pretty good to me. But um, when I'm looking for a job, I think the most important thing is a cultural fit. Finding a company that shares my values and is developing a product that I believe in is the most important thing when I'm looking for employment. Me too. Yeah, I would echo that. So. Anyone else? 
Okay, so we are way past time. Um, before uh, we move on to some things, I just want to uh, let you all know to mark your calendars for CC5's demo day. Um, there are some current, uh, there are some people in the crowd here who are going to be joining us for our next batch. So you can see the, some of their pictures here. Um, but CC5 demo day is September 27th, 2018, also on a Thursday, also at 7.30 p.m. So please uh, mark your calendars for that. Um, also, also um, we have a Niji Kai. It's going to be at Ra in Roppongi. So it's actually really close by. It's a uh, kind of kitty corner from the Tsutaya Starbucks. Um, Connie and I uh, were in San Francisco right before moving here. Um, and Ra really feels like home for us. It's, there's kombucha, uh, there's chia seeds and everything. It feels great. Um, <laughs> And uh, I want to actually invite Connie up to the stage uh, to uh, have some, uh, to say some parting words. Thanks, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, beer at Raw sounds good. Uh, actually, we have some beers out here. So um, I'm going to have uh, them come around and serve you, we have beer or udon cha, so grab one, we're going to do a toast to celebrate these guys. Today is everything, everything about today is about these six guys. Um, they give us the energy and their classes before that to continue, uh, for us to continue doing this. It's been a lot of work, uh, but uh, you know, students like themselves and all our supporters, uh, Pivotal, for this beautiful space and, and providing us with advice and support. Uh, many of you in the audience, uh, we, we know through our interactions, a lot of uh, time spent advising us and helping our students. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody. Uh, you guys rock. I mean, watching these presentations today uh, really gets me excited about what we're doing and about the kind of uh, um, things that's capable in a very short period of time uh, if you put your mind to it. Uh, a lot of people are very scared to take this first step, quit their job for s three months and um, have no pay during that time and also pay for this program. Uh, they see it as, a lot, of, a lot of people see it as risk, but these six people have seen it as an investment in themselves. Um, so uh, let's get some drinks in everybody's hands. Uh, and, and raise a toast to uh, our students from CC4. Keep passing them down. <laughs> and of course, uh, we've been blessed with wonderful interns this year coming from uh, the US and uh, Japan and also our staff, so big, big thanks to them as well. Right. Does everyone have a glass? What about the graduates? We don't have a oh. glass. <laughs> Someone, which is the most important thing. We can take a can. Yeah. We can just take a can. It's not enough. Yeah. Pass it in. and give back, uh, be kind, and uh, congratulations! Oh, thank you. Hey. Hey. Thank you. Let's <laughs> 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 <That's> mingle. <laughs> <laughs>